Hey guys, how you doing? I'm coming to you today from the middle of the campsies. Uh, it's a, a lovely little walk that me and Max behind the camera have been on. It's so good to have you with us. Last week's Testimony Tuesday um, was watched by so many people. It was by far uh, the most watched thing that we as a church have ever put out on Facebook. So I want to thank you guys for joining us, for being with us, for, sh for sharing the services, for doing what you're doing and helping people to engage and helping people and perhaps hearing about Jesus and hearing about the life-changing power of Jesus for maybe even the first time. We're going to uh, be hearing some testimonies today. Uh, we are going to be hearing from Ernie. Uh, one of uh, our church leaders uh, and then I'm going to be sharing more of my story a little bit later on before we do any of that as always we're going to start with a few songs in worship before we worship together let me just pray God I thank you for this opportunity to serve you today through this online service God I pray that as we worship together as we hear from different people God that you would speak clearly to the people watching today God that you would move in our lives God that you would you would teach us things you want to teach us God and I suppose today as I'm talking about you grabbing my attention God if there's anyone watching today that you need to grab their attention I pray that you would do that today just bless us as we spend this time together Amen Guys, we're going to head into a time of worship now. Remember, at the end of this service, we're going to have a Zoom call together and we'd love you guys to stay tuned and join us as a church family as we hang out together on Zoom. But uh, Ernie will be with you after this time of worship and then I'll be back with you after that. I cast my mind to Calvary 
where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh praise the name of the just now. So much going on. There's so much trouble. But God, help us just to keep our eyes fixed in you. Praise your name, Jesus. Oh, praise the Beautiful name it is, the name 
name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. Your sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is. something about myself don't particularly like talking about myself but um, if there's any merit or anything that's been a blessing to anybody as a result of my life then to the Lord and to the Lord alone be all the praise the honor and the glory 
I am a married man. My wife's name is Mary, and we have two children. Uh, both our children are married, and as a result of that, we have four grandchildren. I'm sure you'll appreciate my Glasgow accent. Originally, I come from Surrey on the southwest London border. I moved to Scotland about 51 years ago. I'm now retired. Uh, I was a chartered surveyor by profession. I was the chief surveyor for a Scottish division of a, an international construction conglomerate for about six years. But then I spent about 25 years of my life uh, freelance, working as a surveyor right across the UK from Shetland to Southampton and from Northern and Southern Ireland and occasionally overseas. And I had several visits to the West Indies to do some work there. I was involved in disputes resolution problems and I spent most of my time teaching construction law. I did in commerce, in industry, in local and national government for public and private companies. As I sound now retired and I spend my time between my family, my church, I do a lot of uh, preaching across the country, both here in the UK and overseas. I'm heavily involved in charity work and so life is not dull, life's not boring and in fact um, one could say, if it's a cliche, that I'm busier now than I was when I was actually working full time. Life's not dull. I was raised initially in the Anglican Church. I then spent a time at a Roman Catholic boarding school in Kent, where I was exposed to Catholic, Roman Catholicism. I then gravitated to a Baptist church, and when I moved to Scotland, I joined a Brethren church, and later a church I was uh, subsequently a member of morphed into an independent evangelical church. And so I suppose I have no pedigree whatsoever. I'm probably best described as a mongrel. When I was about 14 or 15 years of age, I attended a youth rally at a church in London. The church was known as the Metropolitan Tabernacle. It's sometimes better known as Spurgeon's Tabernacle. The reason is that in the late 1800s, there was a, a man of God, Charles Hatton Spurgeon, who passed at the church there for many years. He had obviously died by the time I arrived. But uh, I went there to a youth rally one evening, and it was then I heard the gospel. And I remember thinking to myself, that's exactly what I want. And I look upon that as being a turning point in my life. Since then, I've tried to be a servant of Jesus Christ. It's been an interesting journey and no one could have written the script. Initially I planned to train as a Baptist minister. I had thoughts about going to Australia but then I eventually ended up coming to Scotland and in the last 50 years I've been involved in a pastoral and a preaching ministry which has taken me right across the UK and also, ta also taken me to various places overseas. Looking back now, it's been wonderful to see how that through many difficulties, through many problems, through many situations, God has always been there with us, leading us and guiding us, blessing us and seeking to lead us into his way and uh, we sought to do that day by day in our Christian lives. I think the only way we can leave, live a successful Christian life is to live our lives one day at a time. Well, in some respects, um, life hasn't changed greatly for me during this time of lockdown. You've joined me in my den. This is my study. And this is where I spend an awful lot of time during the course of the normal week. 
But I'm reminded as we have been through this period of lockdown of some words that the Apostle Paul said to the church at Thessaloniki. When he wrote to them, he spoke about their work produced by faith. He spoke about their labour prompted by love. And he spoke about their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. There are three things he commends the people, the Christians in Thessaloniki for. Uh, The first was their faith, the second was their love, and the third was their hope. And all three are really relevant to you and me today during this period of lockdown. Uh, When it comes to our faith, our faith is foundational. Our faith is anchored in the past. It's been our response to God. It's been the time when we trusted Jesus Christ as our saviour. And it's good to remember during this period of lockdown that our lives are based on a firm foundation, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. Uh, And then he moves on to love. He speaks about their labour of love, which is really what we're doing in the present. Uh, Whatever we do, what work we do, whatever form it takes, it's because we love God. And I have no shortage of things to do during this present time. I'm involved in a variety of projects. One of the things we've been asked to do is to write a book about a project I'm involved with in Uganda. It's a church, a school, a clinic, a farm and an orphanage. And we're developing also a Bible college there. A very kind donor has offered to underwrite the costs of of developing and producing the book. And so that's one of the things in my pending tray at the moment. Something else is a book that we have had translated from English into Luganda. That's the main language spoken by the people in Uganda. And I've got to do with the corrections to the translation. Uh, That's also in my pending tray. And then I am also involved in doing some external preaching work. Obviously these days via Zoom and the internet and other means of communicating, but it's a matter of fulfilling obligations that I had. And then he speaks about hope and hope concerns the future. But why do we keep going? We keep going because we've got a future hope. Our present circumstances are limited to time. But our horizons take us far beyond that, beyond the present, into the future, to a hope that's secure and everlasting. So when it comes to what has helped me during this period of lockdown, it's what the Apostle Paul wrote to these people in Thessaloniki about their faith, their love and their hope. And I hope the same might be true for you. As far as our hopes for the church and for my family and for life in the future, then I would simply remind you of three G's. First of all, keep going, keep going. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church at Philippi, he says, I forget the things that are in the past and I press on, I press forward. It's important in our Christian lives that we keep going. The second thing is to keep growing. You remember that Peter, when he wrote his second letter, spoke about the need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we each have that God-given responsibility to grow, to grow in our faith. And I would hope that that would take place in all of our lives. And then the third thing is that we need to keep glowing. So we keep going, we keep growing, and we keep glowing. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you are the light of the world. Uh, Let your light shine before men. And although we should be practicing these things now, we should also be practicing these things in the future. These are practical things that we can each do individually, but we can also do it corporately together as a church. So there we are. Keep going, keep growing, and keep glowing.
Et God bless you. So last week, um, I didn't get through as much as I had intended to get through. But we pretty much got up to the point that um, I was trying to prove people wrong. I was trying to become a millionaire. I'd built all this stuff up and within six months, I lost my business and I lost my house to a fire and I pretty much lost everything. But incredible uh, miracles happened and, and God really restored us and actually overnight God wiped our debt. If you're joining us this week and you didn't watch last week, feel free to go back and watch that and some of what I'm saying today will make more sense after that. So God entirely wiped our debt, it was amazing. We were staying in a five star hotel for uh, three months, six months, whatever, it was a long time. And uh, I I wanted a break, you know, from the, the rat race as it were. I, I didn't really like who had become with the sales. Um, and I just wanted to kind of avoid that, so crazily I, I bought myself a camera. We were staying in this really nice hotel, it was really nice grounds and I started taking photos and they were quite good. I thought I'm going to become a wedding photographer. So I got some fo some friends down with their like wedding dresses on, posted them online on like the Wednesday and on Friday got a phone call asking me to do a, a last minute wedding at Glasgow Cathedral the next day. So that was my very first wedding. Within a week of becoming a wedding photographer, I had a wedding, which was kind of a bit silly and a bit brave, but actually it went really well. Um, not that I was the most skilled photographer, but I'm, 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 you know, comfortable with people. So the atmosphere was nice and relaxed and I got amazing photos. And from then I just spent some time, you know, I, I, for the next year of my life, all I was was a wedding photographer and I enjoyed it and opened a photo studio and that's what I did for a year, took photos. I remained a wedding photographer for about three years but after the first year of it um, I, uh, I, got, I started to miss the money started to miss the money and the crazy thing was like after God delivered me really from that horrific situation I was in uh, and cleared our debts I was so thankful to him, right? Like I testified to it in church. I told anyone that would listen about the amazing thing that God done for me. But I still hadn't learned that lesson. And I don't know why looking back on it. But I still hadn't learned that lesson. To ask God what he wanted me to do. You know, what was his plan for the next phase of my life? Now because of my previous success in sales, I was constantly being offered very well paid jobs. And anyway, this job came in, uh, working for a utilities company as a sales manager, um, and it was good money, yeah, very, very good money. Uh, so I went in there and, and like within two months, I had increased this company's sales by a thousand percent. And again, just like, it, it was too easy. The, the money was too easy, it was, it was making loads of it, it was great. And then this opportunity came up and I'm not really actually going to go into why, because it's a, it's a really long story and there's no really any real point to it. But I got the rights to a wristwatch mobile phone for the UK um, by a chance meeting with someone. Um, and so I had done a deal um, with Peter Jones company from Dragon's Den um, so I had to fly down to London and do this deal with these watches uh, and Peter Jones representatives um, really funny story actually nothing at all to do with the moral of the story but I flew down to London for the meeting and then of course I'd reserved a nice car to go to the meeting and the hire company had made a mistake and the only car they had left was a purple Ford car an old one. So here's me in an Armani suit trying to look the part, turning up to Peter Jones' office in a purple Ford car. And I parked the purple Ford car next to, I think it was his car and somebody else's car, the most 
amazing looking cars I'd ever seen in my life and beside them is my embarrassing little Ford car Anyway, that was another story So I went in uh, and I met Peter Jones representatives and, uh, I done, and I done the deal, I closed the deal there and then uh, and uh, the deal that, that I done was set to pocket me over a million pounds and so I remember coming out there and I'm on the phone to Ella and I'm screaming down the phone and the tears, the, the screams turned to tears because here again I had made it once again I had, uh, I had become a millionaire and uh, I'd proved everyone wrong and things were going to go great and it was wonderful so we had a wonderful two weeks of thinking we were rich <laughs> and uh, then I got a phone call saying that there was something to do with the battery and the phone, uh, they were, the phone was going to launch on the Vodafone network and it didn't pass the it didn't pass the rigorous testing that it had to go through so here is I had done the deal and to be honest to do the deal it had cost me a bit of investment again I'd invested my own money in it thought I'd done the deal and, uh, and there it was gone so God had delivered me from debt but because of again me not asking him what I was to do next I put myself in debt again to try and become a millionaire again thought I had done it again but I hadn't and it was quite a low time and of course to do that deal I'd left my highly paid sales job that I was on so there I was again no job, no business, no money what do I do? now you, you would think wouldn't you that as a Christian who had failed twice I might be sensible enough to ask God at that stage what he wanted me to do and listen to him sadly if you'd think that you'd be wrong I was still just absolutely determined I'd came so close twice I had, uh, I, I had made it if you like almost twice and I thought every third time lucky everyone does it in the third attempt so stupid Dave I opened me a call centre in Cumbernauld and uh, we were selling mobile uh, telecommunications and uh, you know we were doing okay we weren't, we weren't setting the heather on fire but we were doing alright and then what happened in 2009 the world hit a financial crash there was this that great recession some of you remember it and I just thought to myself I can't do this again I can't build everything up again and lose it all again so to be honest before anything could get particularly bad for me uh, I closed the company um, and uh, that was that no more no more business for me and probably at that point I think God was starting to do a work in me to be honest with you but I, st I still didn't get to that place of um, waiting to hear his voice if that makes sense I did for the first time pray about what God wanted me to do but then what happened was I got this phone call uh, from an international company who asked me to go and be part of their sales force in Poland and I'd always wanted to work in Poland I'd always wanted to live in Poland and, and for me and Ella to move there and anyway including commissions and bonuses and things the salary was a quarter of a million pounds a year and so I thought there again you know and, I, and this time it was the first time I had prayed but I made that really basic immature Christian mistake of thinking if it's good it's from God and if it's bad it's from Satan which is not true because sometimes Satan will tempt us with what looks like good things to pull us away from the plan God's got for us and sometimes as we know as we've been discussing God takes us through difficult times through bad things to get us to be the people that he wanted to be so without being patient to listen to the answer I, I, I jumped and I, I jumped straight into like I'm going to do this and, and it was so crazy because God done so many things to show me that I wasn't supposed to go to Poland and I just, you know, I just kept thinking it was an attack and it was Satan trying to stop me having what God wanted for me but actually it was God trying to stop me doing the wrong thing so I went down to London to meet the company uh, to meet the, 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 the owner of the company and, and different things 
Uh, and as I was going to meet him, I only took down one suit with me. And as I was putting on the suit to go for like the interview to meet this guy, my fly burst in the suit. <laughs> now that should have meant main interview null and void, right? You can't go in to meet some multi-millionaire owner or some massive big business and your, your flies burst in your suit. <laughs> so, but like, you know, it was an attack as far as I was concerned and I was going to fix it. So, honestly, man, I was running all over London. Like, I remember being in Leicester Square and all sorts of places just trying to find a tailor to fix my suit so I could get to this interview. Not once did I stop and ask God, God, are you trying to get my attention here? And that's something I've learned as I've got older in my Christian walk and now, serving God, if something doesn't feel right, I always stop and ask God if, he, if he's trying to speak to me, God, are you trying to get my attention? God, is there something that you're trying to say to me? And give him time to do that. But I didn't do it. I got my suit fixed. I ran to the interview and I, and I went in sweating buckets and all that. But anyway, concluded in things and two weeks later I was going to Poland. And we're on the way to the airport, Glasgow Prestwick it was. Um, Ella's brother was taking me and the car broke down. And here I was again, it's an, Satan's trying to stop me having this amazing thing that God's got for me when I'd never asked God in the first place if indeed he did have it for me. Crazy. But I phoned a taxi and the taxi came and picked me up at the lay-by in the motorway and the taxi took me to the airport and they said, sorry Mr Brackenridge, you can't get on the plane. Um, and I argued with him and I argued with him. I didn't pray, I didn't ask God. I argued and argued and argued and I'm quite convincing. So anyway, they said, okay, we'll let you on the plane, but you, but you can't get your luggage on. I said, that's fine. So I left up my luggage and I went over to Poland to start this quarter of a million pound a year dream job with just the clothes I was wearing and nothing else. Anyway, I, I went and obviously bought some clothes over there and, and tried to get my stuff together. I'd left my family at home. Uh, we had Maya by this point. The plan was that I was going to, uh, you know, get set up, buy us a house with a swimming pool and move the family over. That sounds really stupid and crazy looking back on it, but right, that was the plan. So I started this job in Warsaw. I was there on my own. I was sleeping on the floor of uh, somebody's house until I get set up. And uh, after, like, the adrenaline wore off of like the fight and the battle to be there. Like when actually I got to a time of rest, I went, you know, I was going to the office, I was doing a job and I hated it. But more than anything, I hated not being with my family. I just felt like something, something was wrong. Something was, was missing. And I started over just a couple of days getting more and more depressed. I've never been depressed really. I was getting more and more depressed. And after about literally two weeks of being in Poland, I remember being on the phone to Ella um, in the kitchen of this person's house. And I just broke down in tears like I'd never cried before. Honestly, I was like I was curled up in the fetal position. And Ella, I remember, she just said, David, I can't understand you. I don't know what you're saying. And I was just sobbing and sobbing. And, and Ella says, look, I'm going to go. Phone me back when you can talk to me. And she put the phone down and for honestly, Without exaggerating, for at least two hours, I lay there on, the, on, on like a bench in this person's kitchen with the phone clutched to my ear. But Ella wasn't there anymore. And I was sobbing. I was crying. And I just, I just said, God I'm, really, uh, God, I'm so sorry. God, I'm so sorry. I kept saying, God, I'm so sorry. And I realised for the first time that for ten years, I'd never really asked God what he wanted from my life. And, and then the time that I did, I didn't take any time to listen to him. And I knew at that point that me being in Poland was not God's plan. Me being in Poland was not God's will. I had totally stepped out the will of God for my life. I hadn't listened. I hadn't followed. And here I was, a broken man. Uh, broken many times. And in a foreign country without my family, and like what on earth was I doing? 
and it finally dawned on me, to be honest with you, that I'd wasted 10 years of my life chasing this pipe dream of becoming a millionaire. I'd wasted 10 years of my life wanting to prove people wrong when all I should have been doing was trying to honour God, when all I should have been doing was, was living the life that God had called me to live. I remember that night, and I'll tell you the truth honestly guys, this is the first time I've heard God's voice like this since the day that I knew he spoke to me to marry Ella. Not because God wasn't speaking, but because I wasn't listening. I say I heard God say to me, I told you to be a youth pastor when you were 14 years old and I've never told you anything different. I never told you to be a millionaire. I never told you to have businesses. I never told you to do any of that. And I just felt him say, you, you know, I'm so convicted, man, you know. You need to become the man that I called you to become. So I literally, man, the next day I got a flight back to Glasgow. Totally broken. Totally in bits. Realising for 10 years I'd let God down. Realising for 10 years I'd let Ella down. The things that I had put Ella through. Not, not only the fact that I had lost businesses and things had gone wrong and all that. But the man I had become... Being a salesman, the bravado, the pride, the ego and all that. I'm, I'm amazed to this day that Ella stuck with me, to be honest with you. Looking back on it. But I, we made the decision at that point in time. We're not doing anything until God speaks to us. So I had no job and stuff and no money coming in. And still had a relatively big mortgage, a big house in Cumbernauld and... Anyway, this friend of mine that I had met through Eric, actually, um, I hadn't spoken to in two or three years. He phoned me out the blue. He said, Dave, um, I'm reading a youth workers magazine and there's a church that are looking for a youth pastor and God's placed it in my heart. Somehow I feel I'm supposed to tell you about this. So me and Ella prayed about it and felt that that's what we were to do. But if any of you have ever tried to work for a church before, the process is long and drawn out. So it was a six month process and we had no job. But for the first time, we just decided that we're going to be patient and we're going to wait on God. So we actually, at that point, we rented our house out and me, my wife, my four children, we moved back in with my mum and dad. Uh, some big shop businessman moving back in with his mum and dad at 27 years old. Uh, with his kids and stuff and I done a bit of DJing <laughs> to, for some for some food money and pay my essential bills. But uh, long story short, eventually I got that job and finally started in ministry. Finally got to where I was supposed to be. Now there's been some ups and downs in ministry and some to be honest overall amazing times and I'm going to talk about them over the next few weeks. But really my message through this today and my encouragement through this today is I lost 10 years of my life. I wasted 10 years of my life. I mean, God was still good. He gave me my children in that 10 year period. That was wonderful, the biggest blessing uh, imaginable. He pulled me out, the mire, as I've spoke about last week. God wasn't absent. But I wasn't listening. And I think when I think about the blessings that I could have had, when I think about the people that I could have led to Jesus over that 10 year period of time, if I'd been doing what God had called me to do, it still to this day breaks me a little bit. Um, there was other stuff in that 10 years that I've not had time to go into. We'd got offered associate pastors jobs in London with a church down there. And we almost moved, but again, the money was too much for me up here. There was just so many mistakes I made. But honestly, I see it. I see my life in two 10 year periods. 10 years really where I wasn't listening. 10 years of failure. And I'm now in the back of 10 years of blessing. 10 years of success, actually, to be honest with you. And I'm going to be moving on to that time next week. But I want to encourage you if you're listening, particularly if you're, if you're young, but really at any age, you don't need to have the 10 years of failure. To have the 10 years of success. You don't need to throw 10 years down the toilet. 
You, you, can, you can live for Jesus now. Like you don't need to make the mistakes I've made because you can learn from the mistake that I made. You can learn from my mistake and not make it yourself. I can't tell you how important it is. How much I wish someone had grabbed me by the scruff of my neck. How much I wish even someone had slapped me across the face and got me into gear for listening to Jesus, for listening to God. My life would have been so different if I had done that. So I'm trying to do that for you. Like accept this if you're watching today and you're a bit lost. If you're watching this today and you haven't taken the time to speak to God. You haven't taken the time to ask God what his plan is and be patient to listen to the answer. Take this as me grabbing you by the scruff of the neck and telling you do not make the same mistake that I did. I'm so thankful that God's gracious. I'm so thankful that he's compassionate and he didn't give up on me. He gave me chance after chance after chance and eventually I caught up. But you know, like, uh, you know, for example, I'm still in some debt today that I racked up during those 10 years. 10 years later, I'm still in some debt that I racked up during those 10 years. Although God's been good to me, there's still consequences to my disobedience. There's still consequences that I'm putting up with today. Hurts and pains and stuff that I need to deal with today because I didn't listen. And I don't want you guys to go through that. I want to tell you clearly and I want to tell you emphatically that God has a plan for your life. God knows where he wants you to go. He knows who he wants you to be. He knows what he wants to do through your life. And I can only encourage you, please, block all other voices out. Just listen to God. He's the only one who's got all the answers. In fact, he's the only one that's got any of the answers. There are no other answers you're going to find in anything else that's going to make you feel complete or happy. I moved on from that. I'm going to move on to it from next week to, to financially being the poorest I had ever been in my life. I have ever been in my life. But I was the most happy I'd ever been. I was the most content I'd ever been. Because I was where God intended me to be. I was living the life that God had called me to live. And it's been such a blessing over these last 10 years and I can't wait to share it with you. Oh, oh, that was a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> but my, uh, my encouragement to you, and sorry if I'm going round in circles, that mouse has put me off, right? But please listen to Jesus. He knows where he's calling you. There's no doubt in his mind where you're supposed to be. But because we're humans, because we're sinful, because we're messed up, so often we don't listen to that. And we can find ourselves, we don't mean it, I didn't mean it. We find ourselves in, in just crazy situations. We find ourselves living a life that we're not happy with, that we were never called to live, and it's all because we haven't listened to God. So I just want to encourage you today to listen. Are you watching this today? And you just know something's missing. You just know something's not right. Something's went wrong somewhere, but you're not content, you're not happy, you're not peaceful. You're lost. Then Jesus is here today. And he's ready to answer you. He's ready to help you. All you have to do is call on him. And I'm saying that to you. Whether you're a Christian of several years, I was a Christian of 15 years by the time God actually got a hold of me and I started fully living for him. You could have been a Christian for longer than that and you've never fully submitted your life to God. Or you're maybe watching this today, you're not even a Christian. But I just want to encourage you today, just ask Jesus into your life, but don't stop there. That's where I stopped. Ask Jesus to lead your life. Commit to following Jesus. Commit to serving Jesus, commit to giving him full control of your life because what he has got in store for you is so much greater than anything that you could ever imagine, anything you could ever think about. And as I said last week, I think, don't listen to anyone else. Don't listen to any other voices. Listen to the voice of God. And if you've not heard it yet, then do what I did. 
do what I didn't do, sorry, and just be patient. Don't jump the gun. Don't decide, oh, that looks good, that's got to be from God. Wait until you've heard God speaking to you. And as I say so often, one of the clearest ways God will speak to you is through Scripture. So if you're worried about not hearing from God, get your Bible open. Let the Bible speak to you. Let God speak to you. And let him do a work in your life. I'm just going to pray for you. God, I just thank you for this opportunity to continue to share stories with uh, the people that are listening on a Tuesday night with our church family and with, with many, many others. God, I thank you for the way that you miraculously got a hold of my life, for the things that you pulled me out of, and for ultimately the way that you changed me and for, for, for leading me to that place of following you and trusting you. And again, I'm so sorry I didn't do it sooner, but I'm so thankful, God, that you led me to do it now. God, I pray for anyone listening today that doesn't know you. I pray for anyone that's listening today that does know you, but they're not fully surrendered to you God would you speak to them right now, would you make them know that a change is needed and would you bring them to that place of making that change would you bring them to that place of for the first time fully submitting their life into your hands no matter what, no matter what you say, no matter where you lead no matter when you lead they're going to follow you help people to make that decision today Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you've made that decision, I'm going to ask you to type me, wherever you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, send me a message, uh, Home Church Scotland on Facebook, or email me directly, dave at homechurch.scot, and I'll be in touch with you just to, just to talk to you, to pray with you, and to help you not make the crazy mistakes that I've made. Um, we're going to be meeting on Zoom after the call as well. The details are right there. Uh, so log on to Zoom, type in that number uh, and join us as a family. We just spend some time chatting together, some time hanging out. And even if you're watching us tonight for the first time, you're welcome to join us. You're welcome to be part of our family as we do that together. In fact, we'd love you to be. We'd love you to join us. We're back again on Sunday. Our main service is at 11 o'clock. So please do join us for that as well. We're going to finish tonight's service with just one more song of worship. So I trust that that blesses you and I'll catch up with you hopefully on Zoom after this or indeed on Sunday morning. Cheers guys. In the darkness we were away without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the
Till that storm was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the Church of Christ was